And we're finally in the last episode for 1989, so expect a compilation for the year to drop in a few days. For now though, let's see what I've prepared for today. A villain named Snide Gaintry and his mercenaries has taken over a top secret Air Force base in South Pacific. Said base holds a huge stock of cruise missiles and in less than 4 hours, Gaintry will be able to seize control of them all. And that's something you my awesome viewer cannot allow. I'm Batman. Hell yeah you are. Bruce is saying that if you're not gonna deal with it, he will. So jump in state of the art for 1989 Jet Fighter and save the day. Oh, and did I mention that state of the art from 1989 is at best obsolete and at worst ancient today? Cause there will be no jetting on your mission I'm afraid. It will mainly be slow and methodical slick screen cavern exploring under the base that Gaintree took over. But have no fear, while you may not break the sound barrier even once and jetting is out of question in any shape or form, you'll do a lot of fighting and shooting. Enemies will come in many flavors and kinds, from simple turrets, through self-propelling rocket traps to two copters and the likes. But regardless of how many kinds of them there are, they will always end the same. In slowly settling pile of dust after you exploded them out of existence. And sure, to explode something may not be the phrase you hear often, or even one that exists in grammatically correct sentence, but that's what you'll be doing a lot. There are a few weapon upgrades you'll get to find and pick up, and the shield. And you should make sure to do so as they're extremely helpful on your mission. Task force may not be great, but it's decent, which is more than enough for a fun afternoon. Thunderblade originally came out in the arcades and it was a hit there, offering fast-paced gameplay, explosive action and an interesting from above perspective with very neat 3D effects. So naturally a port to C64 was something I was very much into. And for the most part I gotta say that it's not only impressive technically speaking but also very playable. Sure, presentation takes a considerable hit when compared to the original, sprites feel a bit chunky and buildings wobble a bit in the 3D implementation on Commodore's small system but the gameplay is all there and fun. Nearly everything that the arcade offered seemed to be converted down and available, from all the enemies and their behavior to background objects and both game modes in different levels. So from behind the copter and top down view too. It's a hell of a port and as you know, these often were piss poor. So if you like shooters at all and even more so those that came from the arcades, Thunderblade is awesome. Thunderbirds is a mixture of a side view adventure arcade and puzzling experiences. There's four missions in the game and for each you're assigned a two-man team with which you have to pick two items that will help you to complete it. These are saving a man in flooded mine, shutting down a reactor of a damaged nuclear submarine, stealing a super secret Thunderbirds arch villain's plans and thwarting the plot to launch H-bomb missiles. It's easy to pick the wrong items for this, so expect to repeat each couple of times until you figure out what to take and how to solve its puzzles. They're pretty fun if you're willing to excuse game's vagueness and the fact that you'll need to repeat things few times to really understand them. All the while doing that you have to make sure not to be fall upon game's various dangers and hazards, like radiation poisoning or falling rocks to name a few. Thunderbirds' graphics are nice and the controls, while not the most well thought out, are not overly complicated. If you like classic adventure puzzles that are not mouse or text parser driven and more on a shorter side with some arcade elements to keep you entertained, it's not a bad game to try out. Time Soldier was my nickname in high school, as I was as stellar and well kept lad as a soldier, but always found myself in the worst time and place somehow. While you may wonder if any of that is true, let me tell you about Time Soldier on C64, a port from a successful arcade original that's fast paced top down sci fi shooter in which you play as the titular Time Soldier who is tasked with rescuing five great warriors from five different periods of time. Sirius from the so-called Primitive Age, Laplace from the Age of Rome, Deimos from the World Wars, which is an odd name for an era but it is what it is, and finally Altair from Future World, which is another odd name but by now you're used to it I suppose. Each of these is guarded by the end level boss which you obviously have to best, and you will cause you're you and they're just bosses, nothing more, nothing less. It was always going to be difficult to move Time Soldier to home system regardless of what system it was, as original used rotary controls for shooting which allowed you for moving one way and shooting all around. It's not the case on C64. So it's best to seek for and pick up all the weapon upgrades and power-ups you can as soon as you find them to at least counter the control issue a little with more power. Especially that the difficulty level of the original was not changed in any noticeable way, meaning you're playing as demanding game as you would have in the arcades but using considerably less user-friendly and ergonomic controls. Still, it's a fun little title if you're patient enough to learn how to play it efficiently. Titan is a top-down arcade puzzler in which you control a small square-like object and use it to bounce the ball around the level and protect it from falling into the hazards. The ball itself you have no direct control of, kinda like in Arkanoid or Breakout. You can however with a bit of skill catch it by moving your box promptly over it. 
which will allow you to hold it and then release it in a chosen direction. Each level is filled with destructible blocks and other objects, harmless or otherwise. So there are skulls that you want to avoid as hitting any with the ball will cost you one life. There are wall pieces that are pushable, certain floor tiles that will turn into walls when moved over often enough and others. There's a lot to do here is what I'm saying. The goal is to complete all 80 levels by either removing all destructible blocks in each stage like in Arkanoid or by finding and getting to the exit. Titan molds arcade and puzzling quite well, requiring you to both think and react fast to complete it. And if it's something down your alley, there's a lot to like here. Tom and Jerry Hunting High and Low is an average platformer that I used to love as a kid. It is obviously based on the cartoon of the same title and features two protagonists and the usual shenanigans. You control Jerry, who's a mouse, and you have to complete five levels by collecting all pieces of cheese scattered around them. Now, obviously Tom's out there to catch you. At first he will just go around observing what you do, but eventually he'll be actively chasing you around the house. If that wasn't enough, there is also a time limit that is rather unforgiving. You are not defenseless, however, in some locations you can drop a bowling ball on Tom's head or wet the floor to have him sleep on it. Neither is getting rid of him for good, but it gives you a little breather. Jerry's bouncing movement mechanics is a bit odd and requires a little practice to getting used to, so if it feels difficult to control him at first, give it some time, you'll be fine. Between the five side-scrolling levels, there are bonus tunnel stages in which Jerry runs forwards collecting cheese and avoiding dynamite and bombs. I have fond memories of Tom and Jerry and I used to play it to death, but objectively speaking it's neither the best platformer on C64 nor even in the top 10. That said, I would still recommend anyone new to C64 to try it out. Tangled Tales is an adventure role-playing that most fans of the genre would not enjoy today, but back in the late 80s they would most likely love it to bits, as it's an RPG clearly aimed at a younger audience and an excellent introduction to those unfamiliar with the genre. It's also a game with no footage for anywhere, so you'll suffer a minute of screenshots with me. You play as an apprentice wizard who botched a seemingly simple spell terribly and as a result caused a serious ruckus. As punishment you stripped of all your spells by the master wizard. That's pretty much the introduction after which you start by creating your character and assigning skill points to stats of strength, intelligence, speed and charisma. A weird choice for a wizard, no wisdom or even magic, but whatever. And from then onward you're on a mission to make amends, to regain your spells and control of magic which you will start by fulfilling quests for your master, starting with some very basic fetch quests, just like in every other RPG out there. Since Tangled Tales is a genre hybrid with adventure mixed in, you should also remember about grabbing everything you come across that's not nailed down, as all these items may come in handy and you never know when. As you play, you'll also learn new spells, fight when required, recruit people and earn and spend money. You know, your usual RPG fare. And while Tangled Tales is that simple, it's still a full-fledged RPG nonetheless. Tangle Tales is not a large game, it's literally over 100 screens in size only, but it's more than enough to be excellent gateway to the role-playing to any new to the genre players. Take the afterburner and change the perspective from behind the F14 to top-down view and you end up with our next game, Tomcat. In Tomcat's words, in the first half of 21st century we've perfected the technology allowing us to create artificial islands. So we've got 27 more years to do so, cause as far as I know it's still mostly just dropping a lot of sand and concrete in the location we want it to be made. And it's neither easy nor affordable. With some time left, so perhaps change is around the corner. And it would be hella cool as I always wanted to have my own island. Anyway, one of those in-game islands after meteorological phenomenon turned rogue, its computer-controlled defense systems turned on and actively attack anything and everything that comes within its reach. So you jump into F-14 and fly towards the island to destroy its defenses. Tomcat is a vertically scrolling shooter that looks and sounds pretty decent. It features nice smooth scrolling and a solid but not great gameplay. The fact that the F-14 sprite is rather large on a considerably cropped gameplay screen makes dodging shots very difficult in some situations, so keep that in mind. And since we're on the subject, all sprites could use a little bit of color too, as they're mostly grayscale. Overall, the game feels very grayish. Nice, but in very bland color palette. You get to pick up weapon upgrades and missiles from defeated enemies, which is always helpful. Tomcat is not bad, but the fact that there's no end to it and it just circles back from the first stage after you complete the fourth without the word, so no congratulations, no thank yous, nothing, is a tad annoying. US Gold is not the name you associate with great arcade conversions. They were usually quickly put together, shoddy coded and generally speaking lacking, only made to grab some quick cash based on popularity of the IP. Turbo Outrun on C64 is awesome, however. Easily the best 8-bit conversion out there. At least when it comes to microcomputers, consoles are another beast entirely. Gameplay-wise, not much has changed, you're still racing from checkpoint to checkpoint, within the time limit and avoiding the traffic. You have your typical high and low gears, and the addition to this outing is the turbo, which may take a lot to charge up after using and gives you just a few seconds of boost, but it's a considerable speed up, and can make or break your game. So best keep it for straight stretches of the road. 
What made Turbo Outrun better than the previous entry is the quality of graphics, sound and fluid movement. It just plays well. See so if you liked earlier game, this one's even better. Though I have more fond memories of the original. Turbo Outrun takes you from New York to LA via race split in 4 stages, with each stage splitting into 2 routes for a total of 16 different sub-stages, which adds a lot to replayability since you can pick different paths for each playthrough. I remember always feeling as a kid that C64's Tasker looked like a real movie on the screen of my TV. Today it's obviously no more than a jumbled mess of big pixels, but for the time, on C64, it was an incredible sight. And even now, compared to most other games on the system, it looks fantastic. And no wonder, as it's System 3 that stood behind it. The very one that gave us International Karate, The Last Ninja, Vendetta, Myth and Flimbo's Quest among others. Quality titles in both presentation and gameplay. Tasker's inspiration in Indiana Jones is more than obvious, not only in the lettering on the ever-present on the screen game's title, but also how our protagonist looks, the setting and how the game plays. But that's not bad, quite the opposite. Tasker, in essence, is an action-adventure game with some simple environmental puzzling, kinda like the aforementioned The Last Ninja, but a bit shorter. So you'll be killing bodies, picking up and using objects, switching various levers and switches and solving simple puzzles. The assortment of weapons available to you is also in the team, so there's a machete, pistol, sling, knives and a cult classic whip, the most iconic of Indies armaments. Tasker is split into three levels, desert, caves and jungle, to be precise, and tells a tale of you searching for your father who also was an adventurer and supposedly disappeared after finding the mysterious legendary elephant graveyard in Africa. The Untouchables is an excellent tie-in to the Mafia movie of the same title and sorta of follows its plot too, as best as it can at least. You play as Elliot Ness and you're after Al Capone, the infamous ganglord of the 1930s. The game is divided into six sections, levels if you will, and they are the warehouse, in which you search for evidence against Capone, all the while fighting off his goons. Arrows will guide you in general direction of the evidence held by the men dressed in all white. There's 10 pieces of evidence to grab in this stage overall. Then there's the bridge, which plays a little like Operation Wolf, so you lie on the ground shooting at incoming gangsters. Third level covers the Alice, and it's the only one that is not representing scenes from the movie in any way. You're hiding behind the wall and have to jump out to shoot the enemies. After every two shots you need to reload, so it's best to hide back for it to conserve HP. Fourth scene takes place on the railway station and features top-down shooter adjacent gameplay. You have two objectives here. Shoot the gangsters and stop the baby carriage which keeps rolling down the stairway. In fifth level, you don't play as Elliot Ness, but as George Stone, and it's the shortest stage of them all. You have to save the accountant who's taken hostage by one of the gangsters and you're given just a few seconds to shoot him. Don't hit the hostage though, as it's an instant game over. Sixth and final stage takes place on the rooftops. It's very similar to the third scene, and after you go through a series of shootouts, you need to kill Frank Nitti, Capone's assassin, who's running away. The graphical and sound design of Untouchables is fantastic, and it's one of the best movie tie-ins on C64. I pondered for a while if Wall Street should find its way into this video, as I'm not sure that it's a game at all. I mean, it's hella fun, but it's more of a financial simulation rather than the game. It's a title for those who enjoy Excel sheets, bar graphs, pie charts and series of long numbers to work on. So if you're such a person, it's a dream come true for you. Wall Street is just that, a simulation of stock market with all that it entails. So at the start, you're asked a series of finance-related questions and based on how well you answered, you will receive a different amount of money from the investors. Money to multiply. Or lose, because it's all in your hands, really. And no two playthroughs are alike as the performance of stocks is randomized between the gameplays. Up to four players can enjoy Wall Street, and if you own a disc version, it even contains a program to manage your own depots. While I'm still on the fence if Wall Street is a game, if you're in the right mindset, it may be more fun than many other games are. War in Middle Earth was released for both 8 and 16-bit systems, and it's virtually the same title apart from stripping of all the questing and RPG elements on 8-bit machines. Well, if it doesn't have something, it's not the same. Perhaps, but the main fear of the game is the strategic layer and everything else are only side elements adding extra flavor to this already pretty fun title. Your main goal, same as in the books, is to get the One Ring to Mount Doom. So if you fail by having Frodo Kilto corrupted or if Minas Firith will fall, the game will end with your failure. This is the only adventuring part present in all versions of the game, despite what system it came out of. Other than that, it's pure strategy, with you having your armies all around the Middle Earth and Sauron slash Saruman having theirs. So you order around your armies, trying to secure a safe passage for the Ring Bearer and in the same time protecting the Middle Earth from evil's corrupting influence. Battles take place in real time and carry on until one of the sides is completely defeated. 
Each character or soldier has their own statistics and their performance in combat is based off these. If Frodo at any given moment happens to be in combat and wants to leave it, he can use the ring to disappear, but it raises his corruption level and sends Nazgul's his way, so it should only be used as the last means, when no other resolution is possible. War in Middle-earth is fun, even if not easy, as it allows you to employ a whole plethora of different strategies to complete the game. You can have all armies surround the ring bearer and escort him and then try storming the gates of Mordor. Or they can fight numerous battles involving the evil forces in combat and giving Frodo a free reign to race to Mount Doom. And that's just scratching the surface. Now let me be clear here, there are better strategy games, quite a few of them actually, but War in Middle-earth has that Tolkien touch to it and because of that it's eerily enchanting. War Machine is a flick screen shooter platformer. I think that 1989 was about the time that we should have forgotten about flick screen design and focused on scrolling. Clearly, War Machine did not get the message. War Machine is a below average game that is frustrating most of the time you spend at it. The graphics are decent, but the main character sprite is a mess. I mean, I know he's supposed to have a gun mounted on his arm, but it looks very weird, to say the least. The action is not very fast and exciting and jumps require pixel perfect aim and there's a ton of them. And when I say pixel perfect, I mean it. Many platforms also end at the edge of the screen, which you don't know until you jump through them to the next one, flicking through and ending up falling to your death. It's not a great game design if you ask me. So if you're easily annoyed, it's definitely a title to skip. Though, if you really are, you're probably not watching this video because apparently I am too. Anyway, if you have fond memories of the game, do not try coming back to it. It's not worth to spoil it. Otherwise, you have to find all four pieces of the mysterious weapon that can be used to defeat the evil leader of an alien syndicate, and you have 80 minutes to do so. Seems like not much, but you won't play the game for as long anyway. I'm pretty sure of that. There's also extra weapons and ammo you get to find along the way, and you have a jetpack. They're helpful, but don't change how War Machine plays, and it's not great. Wastelands is a futuristic sci-fi versus light cyber fighting game. Conceptually, it's more similar to titles like International Karate than Street Fighter, as it features identical combatants with no unique special moves, finishers or supernatural abilities, and it's played for points and not to a knockout. So fighters can jump, roll, kick and perform sword attacks using joystick. Most successful hits are worth a point, with an exception of sweeps that are worth a half of it and jumping sword attacks that are one and a half points. Whomever scores 6 points first wins the round. Wastelands can be played in 2 player versus or tournament mode, and it's fun for what it is, especially against a friend, but don't expect it to hold your attention as long as in International Karate did. And for some reason I keep saying Karate, even though I know it's Karate. Odd. Wicked is Wicked. It's a real-time strategy with horror and occultist theme and undertones. Unknown evil forces of darkness want to conquer and cover the earth in eternal dark. You, as a force fighting for good, have to stop them by driving them back where they came from. To do so, you have to purge clean all 12 astrological signs, each consisting of three levels filled with bodies. Although that's probably not the best word for them. The goal is to multiply plenty enough of your spores to overrun all evil portals before the enemy manages to overwhelm you with theirs. So you'll be shooting enemy spores to halt their growth and reduce their spread, but you also use picked up seeds to create new, for the lack of a better word, good portals that release your spores at strategically picked spots. You have to be quick, however, as the evil guardian spits out new spore seeds too, which if not collected in time, create new evil portals. If you manage to cover all enemy portals with your spores, you win the stage and move to the next. From time to time, tarot cards will appear, and when picked up, they can offer positive or negative boons. And you'll need to learn to recognize which are which to be successful. Wicked is played in day-night cycles, and it's considerably more challenging during night time. It is also when evil guardians are invincible and can't be tackled until the day arrives. Wicked is very unusual, and can be started in one of three modes, focusing on strategy, action or mix. If you've never had a chance to play it, despite how odd it seems, it's worth giving it a go. Trust me. Windwalker A Tale from Mobius is a sequel to earlier Mobius and a fantasy role-playing beat-em-up mixture. Let me clarify that everything I will say from this point onward will be based on what I found about it online only, as I've never played it. First of all, apparently most of the main characters and game's storyline background is found in the manual only, and it's recommended to read it there before starting, which I can understand to a certain degree but would prefer if all of it was served in game. To give you a general idea what it is, some kind of evil Far Eastern warlord with help of his talented and as evil as himself alchemist deposed the emperor and enslaved the fantasy kingdom. You have to find a way to bring back the emperor to his throne. Most of the gameplay is your typical role-playing fare, especially that the engine used is similar to that of other origin titles, with top-down worldview and tile-based graphics. 
This time, however, the graphic tiles are bigger and tend to overlap each other, seemingly for stylish reasons only. But any and all combat encounters take place in a side view, where they take form of a jumpy real-time versus kung fu fighting. It's not bad, but it's also not as good as even the basic fighters of the time were. It's a neat idea, as it's very different from tried and tested turn-based formula, but won't blow your mind. It's an interesting choice, but ultimately wrong, given how you get no experience from combat and all your XP is amassed by completing tasks. Windwalker is an unusual title and one definitely worth checking out if you're a fan of RPGs, especially if you're into Far Eastern teams. I loved original Wonder Boy on C64. The opinions about it may be different, but I really did. And still do. And that's why I was looking forward to Wonder Boy in Monsterland. And as it turned out, it was an entirely different animal. Not frantic arcade platformer, but more methodical one with role-playing elements. Arguably a better game. I don't feel as much melancholy towards it, but still really like it nonetheless. It takes place 11 years after the original, when our protagonist is a local hero and holds the highest of honors, the title of the titular Wonder Boy. Peace, however, cannot last in video game worlds forever, as if it would, there'd never be no more new games. So, a fire-breathing dragon appeared, seemingly from nowhere, like a Pokémon out of high grass, and took over Fantasy Kingdom with his army of evil monsters. Since regular folk are not as courageous, tough and heroic as you are, the land quickly fell and turned into its shady mirror image full of demons and devils and other outworldly monstrosities. Hence why Wonderland turned into Monsterland. So, since Tom Tom is the Wonder Boy, and by extension of it you are too, cause you'll be in control of him, the fate of one's beautiful kingdom is in your hands. Same as the joystick that you'll use to save it. There's 12 stages in the game and they all are converted to C64 flawlessly, in terms of their content at least. Other than one boss fight with monkeys, as in arcades they jumped in semi-random fashion, while on C64 they do between two static points, which makes them very easy to beat. Defeated enemies leave coins or bags of cash behind, they can be used in shops to get better weapons, shields, armors and boots. And each stage ends with a boss fight. Graphics obviously took a hit, but it was expected. They do not get in the way of game enjoyment, however, and are not terrible, just reduced in their fidelity, so it shouldn't be an issue really. Sounds, and especially music, are excellent, but you wouldn't expect anything else from Commodore's Sid chip. A little very capable piece of silicon that is beloved by many to this very day. Overall, Wonder Boy in Monsterland is really fun. In my eyes. Your opinion may differ, obviously. Exout is a superb horizontal scrolling shoot em up taking place underwater. An unusual setting for this as the genre goes. Which is good, cause one thing C64 was not low on were excellent shoot em ups. So any novelty, anything that stuck out is always worth pointing out. But that's not all Exout introduced in its design. Instead of lives, it offered different ships, each with their own armament. There's four different kinds of these that you can purchase and they are used as lives and can be armed with weapons picked from available 12. There are also different drones and eight types of satellites. It's a lot, is what I'm saying, and will keep you entertained for a while. So, it's only natural that you start the game in a shop and not on the playfield and you get to visit it between all levels. The enemies are obviously all different in both how they look and their behavioral patterns, and there are fun and challenging, often gigantic mid and end level bosses too. Other than that, Exout is your typical horizontally scrolling shoot em up, but phrasing it like that undermines the sheer amount of changes to the formula I just mentioned, and the game does not deserve it. So let me highlight it once more what an incredible title it is. Easily one of the best on C64. Definitely in my top 5. Oh, and graphics and sounds are really good too. All the sprites and backgrounds are top notch, painstakingly detailed, and smoothly animated. X Out is great, and it's a must have in any shooter fans collection. In the arcades, Xenophobe was a simultaneous free player side view flick screen sci fi shooter, and it was. well, okay. It wasn't a huge hit, but it was popular enough to warrant itself some home conversions. Commodores being one of them. But as most conversions go, this one's also not without some cuts here and there. Most importantly to suit our TV screens, to which most of our C64s were connected. And to utilize both joystick ports, our small home outing lost the third player. Which is not a big issue if I'm to be honest, as given C64's rather large horizontal pixels, screen divided in three would jumble all the sprites beyond recognition. Anyway, story-wise, after a space station orbiting Earth sent out a distress call and then went silent, a single ship escaped it, piloted by a wounded and barely standing single man, who explained that the station was raided by acid-spitting Xenos that made a hatching lair out of it. So you, the savior of mankind and few others, are sent to deal with it. And I marvel and admire your perseverance and determination, cause just as you cleared off the seas of the aliens in X out, you have to fly out to space to do the same in Xenophobe with virtually no break in between. You, or even better, you and a friend start with a standard issue basic rifle, but along the way you'll be able to pick up and wield various other weapons like phasers, lightning rifles or even bombs. Sounds great, but it's average game at best. Graphics are so-so, with many of the backgrounds feeling samey, the controls are odd and the game overall feels unsatisfying. 
To summarize, technically speaking, Xenophobe is fine, but graphically and in terms of gameplay it's nothing special and I wouldn't go out of my way to find it if I were you. It's a bit better when not played alone and then it's actually quite fun, not great, but definitely fun. And that's the end of 1989. I'll start covering 1990 soon, but for the time being let me know what you think of it. Could it really be the best year for C64? Let's discuss it in the comments below. If you liked the video hit those like and subscribe buttons below, if you didn't, well then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not, other than subscribing and hitting that bell that is. And when you hit that bell, whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you a small and friendly notification about it, so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so, they will help me release better content and also they get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're amazing and stars among the retro community. You will find names of their channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.